I definitely push people's buttons and I push people's perspective on things. And I will say that's one of the things that I'm most proud of from when, when I was there was there were definitely very conservative, closed-minded people. And having me as a person around them, you know, whether I was an acquaintance or I was a friend, it definitely made an impact on their perspective to see me as a human being and to realize, like, I'm not the people that a lot of conservatives make out to be the LGBT community. Um, and I have, you know, for instance, one of my favorite people uh, was I did a, a coming out in one of my public speaking classes. And the entire class was not expecting it. The professor I at least clued in ahead of time. So she wasn't like on the, you know, covering in a corner. Um, and I got a standing ovation at the end of that speech. And it was one of the most moving speeches is what most people in the class told me, like, because they didn't know they were like, you know, you're just a person in our class that we had no idea. And there happened to be one individual in the class who was a poli sci uh, political science major who is now actively completely changed from Republican to Democrat and actively helping people in the LGBT community when it comes to politics. And he said a lot of that is due to what I said in my speech. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from across the entire spectrum of non-monogamy to hear their fascinating stories. We strive to bring guests on the show who have a healthy approach to non-monogamy. However, it's important to remember that everyone does it a little bit differently, and the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we produce this show for entertainment purposes only. Please be aware that we aren't doctors or therapists. Consult the medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Welcome to episode 199. We're Finn and Emma. I'm are excited. We, Emma, are we getting close to episode 200 or <laughs> We're what? so close. We're so close. I was thinking maybe we should just call it quits here. <laughs> yeah. Don't do this. You're going to psych people out that we're actually quitting. We're not. Well, Don't we'll get quit worried. after this episode. Don't get worried. Don't get worried. <laughs> we're going to do 200 and then 201 and then 202. We'll keep going. All right. I'm, <laughs> on, I'm on board. Today, we have a kick-ass interview with Mason, who has been exploring non-monogamy for about five years and has been an amazing trailblazer for LGBTQ plus rights. And this is just an incredible discussion. Yeah, to Emma's point about being a trailblazer, uh, he went to a private Christian school and during that time there transitioned from female to male and uh, was also selling sex toys, having sex toy parties and helping educate his fellow classmates about the, the best toys for them. And it's just been an amazing journey and we're really excited to get uh, his work out there. Uh, you can find more about uh, the education that he does and selling primarily sex toys to other trans people, helping them find toys that fit their body uh, correctly or the uh -huh. best fit for them, as well as uh, he works with a lot of the companies that make these toys to help make their packaging more inclusive. And it's just fantastic work. So we're super excited to have Mason His on the show. His work is amazing. Yeah, for sure. And so thank you, Mason, for the work you do, for coming on to share your story. And, and what we're going to say is you can find out more about all of his stuff at masonluke.com. I was going to say that. Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're starting to complete each other's sandwiches. Sam <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I feel like you forgot because you said that a little bit ago. So anyway, right. I was trying to jump in and help out. Much appreciated. <laughs> Uh, Mason was actually put in touch with us. We were put in touch with Mason through one of the amazing people in our Patreon community who has a business of her own that we just wanted to plug really quick. Her name is Angela, and her business is called The Art of Success for Women. And she is an intuitive empowerment coach for women uh, who works with women-identified people to who have spent their life taking care of everyone else to reclaim their purpose and make the impact that they're here to make. Yes. And so we're super excited to kind of plug this. Um, she's been doing this work for a while. And yeah, we're excited to get it out there. So if you want to learn more about that, uh, you can head over to the art of success for women.com or to our website, normalizing non-monogamy.com. There's links in the show notes. And she's also starting a free book group this week for uh, the book Untamed by Glennon Doyle. So Which is amazing. We've read it. It is. We listened to it. We listened to it. Correction. You're right. We listened to the audiobook. But amazing nonetheless. So if you want to learn more about that, head over to her website, reach out to her. And again, all of the information for Mason's website and Angela's websites are in the show notes. All right. 
before we jump into Mason's interview, we do have our announcements. First off, a huge, huge thank you to our Patreon community. We're incredibly grateful for each and every one of you. This month, our Q&A is tonight. That's September 15th. If you happen to miss it, don't worry. We'll have another one in October. And if you've never attended a Q&A before, we actually do two of them, one at 9 p.m. Eastern and the other one at 8 p.m. Pacific. So there's two of them tonight. And these are really informal discussions. Bring questions, talking points, anything you'd like to open up and have a wonderful discussion about. Um, we also have men's and women's groups calls. Those have already passed for September, but don't worry, they will be back in October. Yeah, and just to uh, tack on a little bit to the end there, if you're looking for community um, in the non-monogamous sphere or just open-minded people, give it a sh- give it a try. Yeah, check it out. It's wonderful people, amazing people. We have made a ton of actual really close friends. Oh, totally. Out of this group, so. Check it out. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the Patreon button. Yes. And one last thing before we get into this awesome conversation with Mason is we've got some other virtual and in-person events coming up that we wanted to mention just some dates for. So you can head over to our website and sign up for any and all of them. Yes. So our next virtual meet and greet is September 22nd. That's next week from 9 to 11 p.m. Eastern. Sign up now. We'd love to have all of you join us. It's a virtual meet and greet. So much fun. We also have an Ann Arbor, Michigan in-person meet and greet coming up on September 28th from 6 to 9 p.m. And an Atlanta in-person meet and greet on October 13th from 7 to 9 p.m. And then we will are working on one in St. Pete's, Florida that will be announced soon. It will be on October 27th, so you can mark your calendars. We're just finalizing the location. Everything will be announced next week. But yes, we're super excited about these events. And if you want to learn more about all of them, how we're handling COVID, how we're trying to keep everybody as safe as possible while having maximum fun, yes, head over to our website and click on the community events tab. And under there, you will find in-person events and our virtual events and all of the ways to sign up and join us and come meet us in person. Yes, we're so excited. And I know Finn said that that was the last thing before we jumped in the interview, but I actually have one more other quick announcement, or I should say we do. You may remember back in January, we did a special series called Power of Witness, and this was a group coaching series with Catherine of Expansive Connection. This was a very powerful experience for us as well as everyone that attended or joined in the podcast and hopefully listened to it as well. Um, We just wanted to make a quick announcement that Catherine is doing another cohort of her Power of Witness group coaching that will not be on our podcast, but is equally powerful for all of you. And we encourage you to go check it out. She, um, The deadline to sign up is this 22nd of September. So um, go check it out now. Links are in our show notes uh, under normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the podcast tab. You can find links there. And you do to get a discount too for using the links on those page. So go check it out. Yes. And uh, thank you to Catherine for that. Thank you to everybody for listening. Um, for joining us today. We're going to jump into the interview and we hope you enjoy it and we will see you in the outro. Yeah, let's go talk to Mason. Well, welcome Mason to the show. We're so excited that you're here today with us and that we're all sitting down to talk and get to know more about you. So thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited that a friend kind of introduced us and kind of told me a little bit about your podcast and you guys were able to thankfully get me in even with a little bit of an interruption in our schedules previously. Yeah, it's all good. (laughs) Yeah, no worries at all. We're excited to make it happen and a huge shout out and thank you to our mutual friend. We need to get we need to get cleared if we can share their name. Yes. So, so we'll wait uh, on that. <laughs> so that's going to be ambiguous until we record the intro. So anyway, uh, yeah, thank you for being here. Do you mind introducing yourself for us and for the listeners? And we'll take it from there. Sure. So I'm Mason Luke. I am a 34-year-old individual in a poly relationship as well as a transgender individual. And I own my own business, which is selling adult products. I've been doing that for the last 15 years. Wow. And I specialize in items for the LGBTQ plus community. Wow. Awesome. That's amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you for that work and, and again for being here. Uh, so polyamory, uh, how long have you been exploring that and maybe what got you interested? So I've only been exploring that roughly in the last five years. 
Um, I have been married for the last, I'm really bad at math, but we've been together for like 10 plus years. So I just go with plus, you know, add on. Yes. Um, just add so roughly, in case you're the law. Think, yeah. So roughly about like halfway through our relationship decided that polyamory was something that I wanted to explore. Um, and it took a lot of conversations to be able to get to a place of understanding and trust that, you know, I could be able to explore polyamory, even if my partner did not want to at the time. And then eventually started, I would say, seeking friends with benefits for roughly the last five years and had really successful relationships that way without making them into long-term partnerships um, in which uh, we, we really avoided the term boyfriend uh, because we didn't want the relationship to be that significant that my partner felt as if I was seeking someone outside of them or to replace them. Mm-hmm. Right. And then only within the last two weeks, I recently added a boyfriend to my relationships. Wow. Well, that's exciting. We're going to have to get come back and circle, circle yeah. back to that. Uh, but I was wondering if you could take us back to some of those early conversations with your partner. How how did they go? And and yeah, what? how did you two navigate that? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll start with the background of I'm a trans individual and I also sell sex products, right? So I have both hormones added to my body to make me, you know, more masculine that increases my sex drive. And I naturally have a high libido to begin with. And I sell sex toys, which, you know, I basically get paid to masturbate half the time. So, you know, (laughs) keeping up with me sexually was something that my partner, not a knock at her at all, but like, I just have a very high sex drive to begin with, plus all of these other things and wanted to be able to pursue more sexual relationships rather than romantic relationships. And it was just trying to navigate, you know, what that meant for our relationship and, you know, having her understand that I wanted someone basically to play with, not necessarily to form another relationship with. And coming to that understanding took probably several months before it was sort of an understanding that, okay, this person is there sort of as a sexual outlet, not as someone that I'm looking to replace her or add to my, you know, relationships that I want to have long term. And had you, I guess, prior to this, like, were you exposed to polyamory or non-monogamy, like, before the last five years? So yes and no. I would say growing up, I did not see it at all. But in my, I'd say like 20s to 30s, I definitely had a lot of friends who identified as polyamorous. But I never really understood it to be something that I would work into my own life just because I had a very happy relationship. Like my partner was fulfilling, you know, pretty much all of my needs. I didn't feel like I needed to go outside of my relationship in order to have other needs met at the time. And then as things started to change, I learned that I don't have to depend on one person to meet all of my needs. And I found out that, you know, other people were having polyamorous relationships where they could get all of their needs met and not rely on one person. And I, I kind of, once I understood that model, I was like, that makes so much more sense now to not try to depend on one person for everything and that I could use different people to meet different needs in my life. Right. Mm-hmm. And how did the your transition line up with the polyamory journey? Like it's it sounds like that transition and and starting to take hormones was part of the driver for like the increased libido and and some of these sort of um catalysts. So I guess could you talk a little bit about like how the timing lined up for those and maybe if your transition played a, a role in leading into polyamory? Yeah, I would say they're connected, but in, or I'll say they're intertwined, but not necessarily related. Um, so I was starting my transition pri- significantly prior to starting my uh, interest in polyamory. But I do think that some of it still was connected only because as I transitioned, I developed more sexual interests. You know, previously I was only ever attracted to uh, female identified people. And all of a sudden, after taking hormones and kind of doing some self-reflection on my life, I realized, you know what, I am more attracted to male figures as well. And not and being in a, mal, uh, a, a monogamous relationship was not going to fulfill that interest or that curiosity because I was in a relationship with a female-identified person. Um, so I would say I think hormones had a, a factor in it. 
but I don't think it was the full reason or anything like that. Uh, it just happened to be coincidental that as I was transitioning, I was doing self-reflection on myself and realizing I also had interest in men. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. And I think I, I was just interested to that, like your transition, it sounds like was after you were together with your partner. Is that correct? Uh, I would say they were taking place around the same time. So, for instance, um, I came out in college as trans. I was born or I assigned female at birth and lived mm-hmm. most of my childhood as a female, uh, you know, grew up as a little girl. And then once I got to college, I figured out what transitioning was, you know, how it affected people, um, learned about how successful people were, you know, with taking hormones that they could live authentically. Uh, so I pursued that in college right around the same time I was meeting my wife. And, you know, we had become friends at that point. And she was very aware of my desire to fully transition even when we were meeting. So that wasn't necessarily something that was a factor in our relationships since it was always kind of there. It just wasn't medically happening until later on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's, I thank you for clearing that up. Cause I think that was sort of my question is like when you, like if you had met as a female and then transitioned to a male, like that's, that's a lot of change for uh, someone to, first of all, for you to go through, but also for your partner to go through. Correct. It sounds like you and were, I, you went through that journey together. Correct. Yeah, very much so together. I mean, not always, um, I'll say out publicly with that information, but mm-hmm. at the same time, we didn't hit, um, we had other blo- roadblocks in our, <laughs> in our relationship. You know, we both were, as you mentioned, female identified people at the time in college at a private Christian school. <laughs> and we were out with our relationship that way. Uh, so it didn't help at all being like, you know, a set of lesbians on a c- private Christian campus, let alone being a trans person, which happened later while I was there. Wow. That's a lot. And I I guess, can you talk a little bit about that experience? So being a lesbian identified person was problematic for many people around me because, you know, they didn't understand it. Um and my school was set up very, very gendered, you know, like there was no visitation of the opposite gender on certain days of the week and times. And they were trying to figure out, like, how do we navigate that? Like, you know, are you allowed to go on this hallway during this time, even though, you know, you are a female identified person, but you're also dating this female person. So they had to like, try to come up with like a whole set of new rules for like how things could go and not go. Um, and then there were people that just didn't like our relationship. I um, was meeting with the dean regularly for being reported for things that never happened. Um, you know, I was being, t- you know, people would be like, oh, well, you know, this person was, you know, in this room after hours. And I'm like, I was not on campus that whole weekend. So I'm not really sure what was happening. But I wasn't here. And the dean kind of realized it very early on that, like, there was definitely, um, people that were being very homophobic and and reporting me for things that were not happening and just trying to get me in trouble because they wanted to. And there was no basis for most of what was being said, you know? Yeah. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. It sounds pretty horrible. It was, but at the same time, luckily I had thick enough skin that like I was able to personally deal with it. And there were a lot of other gay people that were on the campus that were not out at the time and I think I took a lot of the the brunt of like what was happening with the administration at the time and was able to translate that to the other gay people to tell them what was safe and wasn't being safe, you know, for later on when they may or may not come out while being there. Yeah. And I think that's just what's so insane about that is, right, like all of these honestly stupid archaic rules, right, are like there to prevent what sex i guess because it's like if you weren't out you could be in another female's room until whenever right and all of a sudden you're out and and they're like uh oh wait now you're now you have to play by the same rules as the boys and it's like yeah how about all of these other people who aren't out like do you think we're literally the only two women here who are like hooking up Uh, it's just so correct and then i put that in the dean's face a little bit too just to like you know promote some problems but you know it was one of those like you know well there's other you know lesbian couples that are still fucking in their dorm room right now i'm sure but you don't know about it because of how you're treating me and they were like "Hmm." (laughs) yeah 
Nothing yeah. you can do about that, though. <laughs> yeah. Right? I just, it's amazing that they don't like think about that. Right. They're like, hey, right. By, by us being shitty, we're just driving people into the closet and they're going to do this anyways. Right. Like, you're not going to stop it. Ugh, so fucking stupid. All right. Anyway, side rant. Yeah, that's not even a side rant. That's that's my main rant. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I guess I'm just curious, like, was there frustration on your part, like, playing that role of, like, I'm out, I'm doing this, and meanwhile, there's all these other people fucking that aren't, that they're, like, sort of, like, skirting all the rules, and you're the one getting, like, reported and having to deal with the dean all the time, or, or was that sort of a role that you, like, took on with some honor? I didn't, yeah, I didn't mind playing that role while I was in school, especially because, you know, I was actively trying to help the LGBT uh, group that was forming on campus at the time, too. Uh, We were trying to get, like, a sanctioned, uh, allowed group on campus. And, you know, I think that people needed to bring issues up in order for them to get resolved and get people's awareness. Um, So I didn't mind it being me. Um, there were definitely times where I wished it didn't happen to my partner, though, because, you know, to me, that was more hurtful than myself. Mm-hmm. Right. Because you can, in some ways, you know how to handle and your own emotion and your own reaction. And you, it's hard when you see someone else that you care about and love go through that. And yeah, I can completely understand. That yeah, there was one point where we had an end of... Um, one of the the official people of campus, I forget what they were called. There's like the RDs and then there's the RAs, so the resident assistants, which are your student people that are like leading a, a floor, right? Yeah. They were trying to prevent my wife from going to her own room because they thought it was mine. And I lived in a different building. Wow. Yeah. And I guess so like the LGBT group that formed while you were there and that you were helping form. I, do you know, like, since then, have there been changes that have, like, helped make it a more of an inclusive space? Like, were you a driver behind some of that? So the group is now sanctioned. It is now a recognized group. Um, they do get some funding, at least, for different activities that they need to do, uh, which is great. That That's progress. Uh, they still have many issues, though, when it comes to gendered language and gendered rules on the campus just because it is a private Christian school. And they can get away with many of it because it's private, not public. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. And what, then what, I guess, moving forward to the, like when you started transitioning, how did they handle that? So some of the administration knew that I was transitioning and some of them did not. I was doing most of it in my senior year anyways. Um, So I had some really good professors that were really great at like, you know, let's change the pronouns, let's change your name, like, I'll address you as this in class. It really confused some kids that were in multiple classes of mine. (laughs) Um, But it it was what it was. Um, I had had one of the same roommates for like three years of school. So for her, her, she was just like, I could care less. Like, you know, I I would live in a co-ed dorm if I could, you know, it doesn't matter whether I have a male or female roommate. So luckily I had a really good roommate who didn't have any issues with, you know, me transitioning while we were living together either. But Mm -hmm. for the most part, people were pretty cool about it. I mean, especially after they already dealt with me being a lesbian, you know, like this was like, ah, whatever, something else. (laughs) Yeah. Here's Mason again. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I definitely push people's buttons and I push people's perspective on things. And I will say that's one of the things that I'm most proud of from when when I was there was there were definitely very conservative, closed-minded people. And having me as a person around them, you know, whether I was an acquaintance or I was a friend, it definitely made an impact on their perspective to see me as a human being and to realize like, I'm not the people that a lot of conservatives make out to be the LGBT community. Um, and I have, you know, for instance, one of my favorite people uh, was I did a, a coming out in one of my public speaking classes. And the entire class was not expecting it. The professor, I at least clued in ahead of time. So she wasn't like, on the, you know, hovering in a corner. Um, and I got a standing ovation at the end of that speech. And it was one of the most moving speeches is what most people in the class told me, like, because they didn't know they were like, you know, you're just a person in our class that we had no idea. And there happened to be one individual in the class who was a uh, political science major who is now actively 
complete, completely changed from Republican to Democrat and actively helping people in the LGBT community when it comes to politics. And he said a lot of that is due to what I said in my speech. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Well, thank you for doing the, being that spokesperson uh, and doing the work you did then and are doing now, of course. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. You know, I'm just, it sounds to me like the broaching polyamory then with your wife is like, an e- easy peasy easy potatoes <laughs> compared to everything else you've done i mean yeah how how did that go like on top of everything else you're like i mean maybe for her too it's just like eh, like this is the easiest thing we've done so far so it i will say it's more like that now but it wasn't like that at first just because we had been together for roughly five years and her biggest concern was that I was going to end up leaving her. You know, all of a sudden I was going to meet somebody else, fall in love with somebody else. And, you know, all of a sudden she'd be on the wayside. Like that was her big fear. And it took a lot of convincing. It took a lot of trust. And it took, I think, meeting other people who were in successful relationships to see that it could work. You know, um, and a lot of it was just calming her own fears and insecurities Um, The other thing that really helped was developing our list of no's. You know, that's one thing that, you know, I keep on my phone whenever I meet a new potential person that I want to play with or pursue a relationship with. This is my list of this is what I'm allowed to do within the bounds of my relationships with other people. Um, And having that very concrete list of like, this is what I can and can't do also was very helpful. And it made things at first, very difficult for me, you know, to, to navigate, like, no, I can't do that. Yes, I can do this. Um, but having it very as a concrete list that I could just, if I'm talking to someone online here, I'm copy and paste what I can and can't do, you know, like, and that helps really confirm things for other people too, to say, okay, you know, Mason's very set in what can and can't happen, you know, and it, it doesn't allow for a lot of gray area. So there isn't confusion when it comes to, you know, was this acceptable or not? Mm-hmm. Do you mind giving us some examples of of what that what that is? What's on my well, list? And, yeah, and also what? like, has the list changed over the years? It's changed only recently, and that's with the development of a boyfriend, uh, and that is a new change too. And that took another couple of years before that even could happen, um, and wasn't something that initially I was pursuing because it wasn't something that. I felt I needed or wanted at the time. So right. for instance, you, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I pulled it up for you. Um, you know, not using the boyfriend title, you know, no romantic dates, weekends, uh, love was definitely not on the table. Uh, routine testing is required. Um, you know, no drugs, uh, I would say, except for like maybe alcohol, if you're in like a social setting, um, you know, no handholding PDA, other things in public. Um, and PDA as appropriate with other friends. So, you know, if I have a friend that routinely like kisses everybody in the room, like that's one thing, but I'm not going out of my way to do that with someone. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's helpful to put some context around it. Yeah. And it sounds like you're, well, maybe before that question, like you, like, were you going on dates? Like, you were able to go on dates by yourself with people, but I guess you said no, like, romantic dates. I guess, how do you, how do you distinguish, like, I'm going on a date versus a, this is a romantic date? Uh, good question. Uh, so, for instance, when it came to, I would say it has to do with the level of pursuing, right? And I would say um, there's different levels of dates that are you know, dates that you can go on with people for sure. Like you could go out with a friend and be like, Hey, you want to go hang out and do this? Mm -hmm. And it's very much a casual thing. There's, I'll say little effort involved. Um, you know, generally for me, it was, you know, you each pay your own way. It's not like we're picking up the tab for each other. Movies is one of the biggest ones that I like to go do with one of my friends, you know, and that's not something that you're doing a lot of like face to face action, or I like to go to arcades or amusement parks it's not like a let's go sit down and have a candlelight dinner, you know, right. like different things like that, that are, I'll say more intimate. Yeah. yeah. And then, and you said like, you're very open then with the people that you're going to go on these dates with that. Like, 
it sounds like they know what the expectation is. So they're yes. not, they're not like, Oh, we're going to go have this romantic dinner and this is going to turn into something. You, you're very upfront about like, this is what it can and can't look like. Correct. And my intention is to not lead people on. Uh, like that's completely like, you know, if I'm in pursuing you, it's I'm pursuing you for generally being a friend or being a fuck one of the two, or maybe both. Um, you know, it's nothing generally beyond that. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, there might be some people listening and it's like, oh, you're just kind of using people. But at the same time, like if you're open and honest about that up front, like they might be looking for exactly the same thing and you find each other and you're like, hey, uh, everybody wins here. So, right. Yeah, right. So I love that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's definitely people that are pursuing relationships and and that's for them to pursue. I'm just not the person that, you know, wanted to pursue that for the longest time and didn't yeah. want yeah. people to believe that I was. Right, right. Of course, yeah. it's best to be upfront about all of that. Right. So I'm curious then, like, what happened with the change n- recently of now going with the boyfriend status? Okay. So I've had this particular friend uh, for probably about three years now that has always been a friend to me, very close friend, intimate in the terms of like conversations we can have, like the depth of conversations. So I feel like I knew them extremely, extremely well. This person was also friends with my wife, so it wasn't like I was having these, like, a relationship with them excluding my wife or, you know, like, going to, like, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but there there was much more connection in terms of depth and in terms of trust. Like, my wife knew who this person was. So we happened to go on vacation together recently. Uh, Both my wife and I went, and he went with his partner as well. And on the car ride home, we started kind of talking about, you know, relationships and how things would work. And we we happened to toss around this idea of like, you know, if I ever wanted to pursue a boyfriend, you know, what would that look like? What type of personality would they have? What would my wife need to to feel confident in what that looked like? So we happened to use him as an example, you know, and that just happened to be the like, you know, well, what if it was this person? And, you know, how would that look? And what would that dynamic look like? And she was like, I'm actually really open to him. And I was like, really? Hmm. So this went on for like a week of just different conversations and stuff. And I was like, but I have, I don't think he is at all like interested in me, like in that manner, like, and has been in a relatively stable relationship for like a while that I, you know, he could be poly, but not necessarily was advertising that. So it was sort of a, I don't know that that would work out. So but we both agreed that this was the type of person that would work out for me to have a boyfriend with. She would trust um, and the relationship dynamic would work. So then I asked him one day, I was like, so do you think I'm boyfriend material? And he was like, absolutely. And then didn't realize that I was then going to go into, well, hey, do you want to be a boyfriend? <laughs> so <laughs> it was very funny because he was like, I don't know who wouldn't want you as a boyfriend, Mason. So then I was like, so I, how do you feel about us? Like, you know, entering a relationship and was, he was very much like, absolutely. I had no idea that this is where it was going. But the other funny thing was that I never picked up on the fact that he was flirting with me regularly. And my wife did. And my wife was like, no, I really think he's into you. He definitely flirts with you all the time. And I was like, I don't see it. I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) So my wife picked up on it way more than I did. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like it kind of worked out to be a win 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 for everyone. Yes. Yeah. It definitely has been. I would say the most interesting thing was um, him telling his partner and asking permission, essentially. So previously, his partner had said, you know, I really don't want to know if you're seeing other people, you know, as long as you're not pursuing a relationship. Like he, that was not really in the cards for him originally. So finally, he was like, listen, I I need to talk to you. I want to pursue a relationship with another person, and I feel that you need to know. And it was also a a requirement for me, like he had to tell him, because I didn't want anything to be said or to to make it feel like I was going behind his partner's back. And I, I value the relationship that they have, too. You know, I everybody needed to know. And I understand that his partner was like, I don't really want to know, but I was like, you need to tell him. So they happened to have this conversation and he, you know, said, you know, I'm starting this relationship. And he was like, okay. 
and they very, very short with answers. And he was like, well, do you want to know who it is? And he said, sure. So he finally said, well, it's Mason. And he responded back, well, he does have one thing going for him. And he said, what's that? And he said, well, I like him. <laughs> so at well, least and, and it, it was good. And I, and the funny thing is like, his partner's personality is one that like, for us, that was a huge win because it's like, he is very, very short and like, doesn't always like to talk about things. So for him to say it that way, we were like, that's pretty big, you know, that's great. So I was really happy with it and glad that that was his response because now at least I feel things will be much more open, a little bit more trustworthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And how how have things developed between you and your wife now that now that you've made this transition from strictly play people, play partners to a relationship? Like that's a different level of energy, that's a different level of connection. I guess what does it look like now versus 3 weeks ago? So not, uh, it is fairly new. So who knows? Things could change over time. Mm -hmm. Um, But for instance, my other goal was that I want to have a relationship, not just with him exclusively, but I want to be able to make sure that my wife is somewhat involved in the relationship. Like I don't want them to not have a friendship as a result of us having a relationship. So including her when we can in whatever we're doing, you know, when it's not, you know, we'll say an intimate date night. Uh, Mm -hmm. So for instance, you know, he came over over the weekend and, you know, we all went to dinner. You know, it wasn't a let's us only go to dinner. Let's all go to dinner. But then we'll go to the bar alone afterward. You know, so just balancing the, you know, when are we together? When are we not together? Um, And, you know, just doing things like that. And then even when we went out the next day, you know, to eat with a group of friends, it was, and we're going to bring him with. And, you know, he is my boyfriend when we go out and I have both a boyfriend there and a wife there, you know, so just figuring out when, when is appropriate um, for everybody to be there or just us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you found it difficult or challenging to now balance like treating your boyfriend like a boyfriend versus a play partner who maybe is like, I don't want to say less important, but like. The, maybe the requires less different. Yeah, it requires maybe less energy. And now you're like putting in boyfriend energy and husband and wife energy. So because we were already in that deep relationship to begin with ahead of time mm-hmm. and he wasn't a fuck buddy to start with, like there was a different starting point. I'll say the relationship itself, as far as the conversation, hasn't changed significantly. Um, I, I would say we just make it a point to talk more often. So instead of just, you know, randomly, you know, like we may talk to each other once a week or something previously. Now we're trying to make an effort to talk to each other like once a day. Right. Right. And now intimate dates are allowed for for this person. Yep. Ah, Very cool. Yeah. Has, has your wife, uh, I know at the beginning you mentioned that she did not start dating other people. Has she, has she gone on her own journey? Not as of right now, but I think she's more interested in it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious. Yeah. No, it's great. And And, and we both have, we, and I I would say it this way, we both have different reasons for wanting different relationships. Um, You know, for her, she's always felt that I could meet all of her needs. But I think now that I'm also seeing someone else, she realizes that she may have more needs to be filled and, you know, not that I'm not going to give her all of my love and attention, but now I have some attention to give somewhere else. So she might be looking for more attention from another person. And that could be friends. It could be a relationship. We don't know yet. Yeah. And I mean, at the same time, people's needs and wants and desires change over time. So who mm-hmm. she was 10 years ago is not necessarily who she is today. Right. Correct. So, yeah. And what are some of the, challenges you said that you you two have had some challenges what have some of those challenges been as you've gone down this path together for the last five years so i would say one challenge in particular is generally i like to we'll say vet to the person with my wife before pursuing anything with them 
in every situation, that's not always possible, you know, depending on where I am. Uh, I do travel for work occasionally, you know, sometimes there'll be places that don't have cell reception, you know, things like that. So sometimes, you know, things happen and it's sort of a, we have to just talk about it after it happens. And I did have one occasion where she just kind of wasn't comfortable with the person that I was with and it was a, okay, learning experience, but at that point, it was like it already had happened. So there wasn't much that we could do about it after that. So it was just, okay, well, how are we going to navigate this in the future? And what maybe other things do we need to add to my maybe list of no's that I should consider ahead of time before pursuing something? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it totally does. Um, how open with other people in your life have you been about your polyamorous experiences and dynamic? So I would say most of my friends know that I'm poly. Um, If they don't, they might just not have been paying attention. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I would say really close family members tend to know that I'm poly. Some, some of them have even met different partners and know that like, this is one of the partners, you know, that I've, you know, or my one or a friend with benefits. Like I'm not shy about like who these people may or may not be. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, cause they're still friends, you know, like if I have a friend, I have a friend. And if I have a family member over, like, here's that friend, you know, it is what it is. Um, I would say that there are definitely still some people in my life that I wouldn't tell that to just because they would be significantly judgmental. And I'm like, you know what, I'd rather not pursue that conversation and waste my breath and time to explain it to them if they're not going to be open about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, and we're all you know entitled to making those decisions. Yeah, and I know you didn't necessarily explore non-monogamy like before you transitioned, because I think what would be amazing is to be like, well, what was it like exploring polyamory as a solo female or as a female, and now what is it like as a trans man? But I guess for somebody listening who is you know transitioning what has your experience been navigating like the world of uh, dating or hooking up and meeting people as a trans man? So the biggest advice I can definitely say is don't pursue a committed relationship prior to starting hormones. (laughs) Uh, Just because, and it's not just me. I've heard this from many, many people is once you start hormones, you start looking at yourself differently. And what you thought your sexuality was or your attraction was, you have like about a 50-50 chance of changing. So, you know, I think people that are especially in monogamous relationships and maybe don't have a chance to pursue something outside of, you know, if they're in a committed relationship, that can be very difficult, you know. And I found, you know, especially for me, you know, when that was happening, you know, is that, you know, I'm in a committed relationship with my wife who I've been married to for five years, but now I have attraction to men and I'm curious about it. And if you're not allowed to pursue that because you're in a monogamous relationship and maybe people in the relationship aren't open, um, that can be very difficult. You know, so I would say either wait to pursue a committed relationship or maybe be open to what may happen if, uh, after taking hormones, you decide that maybe the attraction's changing. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And that's not to say, you know, deny who you are, but just be aware that that process is going to change a lot of things about you. Right. Yeah. Have you found people to be open and accepting? Like, I don't know if it's on Tinder or Grinder or whatever. Okay, Cupid. Okay, Cupid. Yeah, whatever one of the thousand different ways you can meet people for hookups these days. Like, like has it gone fairly well or how has it gone? Uh, definitely has gone very well um, as far as like meeting people. Uh, there are definitely people who are into transgender people because it's a fetish and people want to check a box. Um, and those people I just avoid, block, whatever, you know, the word is on their site. Um, I'm definitely not interested in pursuing those. I'm not a box for somebody to check. But at the same time, there are definitely people that are very, very respectful. And I can generally sense that in how they approach me and what their questions are when they're trying to get to know me, uh, what type of person that they are. 
I have also found that specific communities are really good for, you know, inclusivity. You know, for instance, I'm uh, heavily connected to my local bear community. So, you know, gay men, bigger, scruffier guys. Um, you know, I've gone to many of their events and they've always been very friendly to me, you know, except me as male. And even like other people I've seen how they interact with that are trans and, you know, has always been very inclusive. So I think finding the right communities is also very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's huge. For sure. Yeah. What are some of the like number one or number two red flags that like <laughs> key you into like somebody's just fetishizing you? Yeah. Versus like it's a like, yeah, yeah, versus it's like a genuine interest. Right. Uh if someone generally starts the conversation off about my genitals, I'm like, yep, yeah, probably not. <laughs> uh like you should probably I feel like get that's just a I was like, that's a good uh, red flag in all dating, no this matter is what. True. This is true. <laughs> um, uh, what else? I'm trying to, like, I, I would say that people that start asking me questions about my transness uh, initially, like, it's one mm-hmm. thing, like, to start a conversation, like, I want to get to know you um, and I want to know about your experience, but to ask specific questions, um, like I said, genitals are definitely one of the number one red flags. But, you know, what are my intentions for surgery, you know, now or in like in the past or in the future? Like those are kind of like, you don't really need to know that if I'm fucking you today or tomorrow. Like, you know, you don't need to know what necessarily my future looks like. Right. Sure. Right. Totally. Thank you for sharing those tips as well. Um, Speaking of futures, I know that it's really hard to know the answer to this. Uh, So I'm kind of asking an impossible question. But you've recently had a relationship change. And I'm curious, do you have any thoughts about where your relationships might grow and change in the future? I definitely see the potential to add other people to my relationship at different capacities. Um, I think that, you know, and I think all people could probably be open to this, but the idea that, you know, different relationships in your life can definitely add more value. Um, I'm definitely not saying that I want to collect people in my life. By any means, there are definitely people that are collectors and have, you know, seven boyfriends. And I'm like, I, maybe they fulfill various needs in your life, sure. But I, I don't think that you can add the same attention to everybody um, in a way that adds significant value. But I would say if you can have different people to meet different needs um, and enough that you can maintain the closeness and intimacy, I think that's what's important. Yeah. Totally. Uh, Thank you for sharing all of that too. Um, You know, at the beginning of this episode, you talked about how you run your own company and you've been doing that for 15 years. And I was hoping that you would be willing to share a little bit about how that came about and how that has gone for the last 15 years. Yeah. So I originally started um, with one of the direct sales companies that was selling sex toys, signed up and, you know, sold dildos, slinging dildos in the dorm rooms, private Christian school, (laughs) high needs. Yep. (laughs) Um, So I did that for roughly 10 years and I was having a lot of issues in like the last few years because I had a huge following of trans people who were looking for products and I couldn't get them, you know, like we were, we were limited by whatever was in our catalog. Uh, and I kept having to special request things like, Hey, can you get this? Hey, can you get that? And it wasn't like, uh, everybody in the company needed to sell those, but you know, that's what my clients were asking for. So eventually it was one of those, like, I just needed to make the decision, pull the plug and go, you know what? I need to start my own company and, and be able to have control over my own products. So roughly five years ago, I started my own company and now I'm pretty much LGBT like dominant uh, market. You know, I would say transgender men are my number one client for sure, followed by other letters of the community. Um, and then, you know, a little bit of straight people in there somewhere. <laughs> but uh, Throw those people in too. <laughs> yeah, throw that in too. Um, but I definitely have found huge value in what I do. Um, I look at my company as much more almost like as a service company than a retail company at times, because what I'm doing is not just selling a product. I'm doing a lot of education around, you know, product awareness, um, safety, you know, what materials are safe for people's bodies. Um, A large percentage of what I sell is prosthetics for trans men. 
it's a really interesting uh, product. It's a really interesting market. The problem is that prosthetics are generally made for a single body type. So think of like how many different vulvas there are in shapes and sizes, right? And they're trying to make one product to fit all these different ones, or they don't know how to tell you like which one this works for. So one of the things that I do is I do consultations for people. And, you know, I ask them a series of questions to figure out what prosthetic will work best for them and then direct them to the correct products for their body type. So that's one of like the main things that I do consultation wise, but I'll also help people figure out like what's the right sex toy for them, you know, based on whatever their relationship dynamic is. Thank you for sharing all of that too. It's amazing that you've been able to build that from, you know, back into the dorm rooms to, to where it is now. Uh, and we'll also definitely include links to everything in the show notes from, for your store and everything you mentioned. Yeah. I was just curious, what did the school you were in allow you to have the sex toy parties? Like, was that, was that sanctioned or was that like, <laughs> we're having a, you know, movie night and everybody just knew it was like code for like, Mason's going to have a sex toy party tonight. So uh, I'm sure the school would probably not allow it if they knew that it was happening. However, I did have an RD walk in on one at one time and either they didn't care or they were completely oblivious. I'm not really sure, but there were definitely dildos on the floor in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess if they didn't say anything, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> For them, they were probably more like, you know what? At least they're not having sex. They're having dildos. <laughs> Right. <laughs> right. Yet. 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 Yeah. I like the the picturing of the RA walking in or whatever it was walking into all the dildos. <laughs> yeah. Just Definitely like thinking happened. Of, yeah. It thinking was one of those being... like, I'm not really sure whether to be embarrassed or to hide them all, but we're just going to go with whatever it is and be like, you know what? I already get in trouble for everything else. What the hell? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Why not this too? I'll just add this to my repertoire. <laughs> I'm going to get kicked out. I mean, at least I got kicked out for selling dildos and not for being gay. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, boy. Should not know. be laughing at that. That's oh, horrible. Um, at least I can laugh at myself, so I'm good. Yeah, good. Right? That's, that's right? important. <laughs> so I, I had a couple other questions back on, like, the poly journey for you or the non-monogamy journey for you. So, like, mm -hmm. you mentioned that your wife is now maybe thinking about it. Are you, like... Where are you on that with her? Like, are you supportive of her? Like, if she wants to go out and maybe find another boyfriend or another girlfriend or another partner or, like, I guess, what is your comfort level with her exploring this? So I am very supportive of the, the idea of her having other relationships. I personally suggest friendships first uh, to see how that goes before just hookups just because of the safety involved with it. You know, I, I do... Because I'm I'm a, and by nature a protector, you know I I do want to protect her at some level, you know, and but I realize like this is her body, her choice. Um, but for me, I'm like you know I would rather see her pursue some friendships that lead to relationships and maybe lead to hookups as opposed to, you know, the various apps where you don't have as much control over you know who you're meeting and the safety involved there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's fair. And I think too, though, like it's an opportunity for you to, you know, it sounds like she, I don't know, vetted, but like you introduced a lot of your partners and play partners to her. Like it could be reciprocated, right? Where you're also helping her vet that and be safe if that's what she's True. comfortable with. So yeah, no judgment. Do, do you do you? However, I was just thinking about it like that. Um, and I was curious too, like, along those lines, like what are some other ways or some ways that you've seen yourself grow over the last five years of exploring this and maybe ways that you've seen her grow as well? Uh, I would say that my understanding and openness has definitely changed over time. Um, you know, from being a monogamous person who thought that all of their needs were being met to going into some exploration where I would say at least, you know, one need, one additional need was met, which was just sexual, um, to now pursuing, and even just with the friends with benefits. So, you know, there's like one, one time hookup people, and then there's the, let's have multiple hookups. They're more of a friend. So I would say those help sort of a social aspect, you know, now I'm getting a friend as well as a hookup. And now with a relationship, I think that brings it to like a different level of, you know, connection. You know, I can depend on another person 
you know, in a different intimate setting, you know, or a different emotional setting as opposed to one person as well. You know, I, I think sometimes there's a lot of labor being involved with one single primary person, right? So you're, you're depending on them for everything, your sexual needs, social needs, emotional needs, relationship needs, um, sometimes financial needs, you know, so having different people to help you with different things in your life, um, and I think emotional is like one of the hardest ones, right? Because you have to develop a level of closeness to someone to let them in, you know, and I think it's hard to let people in, you know, I think that's why it will be successful with the boyfriend I have now, because we had a three plus year relationship like prior where we got to know each other really well, but I wouldn't depend on, you know, someone I just met for emotional needs, you know, and I wouldn't want to have deep conversations with them off the bat. You know, you have to kind of protect your heart sometimes with different things. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's one of the biggest helps now that I will have moving forward. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, you just triggered to another thought I had, you know, you mentioned that you're, you, you've, the labels have changed been in one of your rules was that love was off the table. Is that mm -hmm. something that's more on the table now? Yeah, I would say it is on the table. Um, I don't know when and how it'll get there. Like I do have a relationship of love with this other person already, but it's a different type of love. It's very much of a friendship. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not positive how that will change, but I mean, there already is that level there before. Right. Yeah, right. for sure. Do you have anything else? No, I, I was just wanted to open it up Mason for Anything that we didn't ask about or talk about that you are hoping to share in the world um, today, we'll put links to everything for how people can find your store and your business. Uh, what is the name of it? Just so anybody listening who who wants to go look it up right now without having to go to the show notes can find it. Um, www.masonluke.com. All right. Easy enough. So links will be in the show notes, um, how to find that. And yeah, is there anything else that we didn't talk about that you were dying to share uh, and talk about today? I would just say that for folks that are listening that, you know, especially people that are having trouble finding sexual products to meet their own needs, um, especially gender related and sexuality related. So, you know, because people in the LGBT, you know, don't always get the products that are designed for them. Uh, sometimes that can be very difficult. You know, when you look at a box and, you know, everything is heterosexual couples um, or you look at a box and everything is pink and very much feminine. But maybe, you know, trans masculine people don't want, you know, things that are pink and feminine and very, you know, vulva centric. Right. You know, they need gender affirming products or sexuality affirming products. Um, definitely take a peek at my store. Reach out if you have questions. Uh, because there are definitely products out there for them, but they're just not as well known about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of have taken up that uh, upfront research to try to match these products with people who are looking and they're hard to find. Right. So correct. And not only yeah. that, but I also have a, a, a good relationship with manufacturers now that when I see things that I'll say, don't drive with me, I bring it to their attention you know, I'm like, do you realize how exclusive this product is? Do you want to make it more inclusive? You know, and I have had very successful conversations with manufacturers that are like, oh, we can easily redo that packaging to be more inclusive. Or yeah, we can remove that female off the box because you think it's off-putting, you know. And, and I will say, if you've bought anything in the last year, you'll see there's a lot less pink and purple going on nowadays. You know, that's very much phasing out. You'll see a lot more like brighter colors now. Um, and you'll also probably find that there's a lot less female and male people on packaging now. Hmm. And you have a part in that. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's been having conversations with the right people. We get right. Yeah. right. You started that in, in college and it's carried on. So I think... Again, a huge thank you for that, for being a uh, drive, ch driving change in, in the community uh, at large. So, yeah, just thank you and thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing everything with us. And it's been fantastic talking. Yeah, have a wonderful rest of your day, Mason. Thank you. And we're back. 
a huge, huge thank you to Mason for coming on the show, sharing his story, and for all the amazing work that you do out there. Thank you so much. And if you want to find information about Mason's work, go to his website, masonluke.com. And links are in your podcast player as well as the show notes. Yeah. And another huge shout out to Angela uh, for putting us in touch with Mason. Again, ways to find Angela and her work are in our show notes and we're at the art of success for women dot com. Dot com. So thank you, Angela. Thank you, Mason. And thank you to everybody who's here listening. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And we did want to make one more quick shout out to one of our favorite affiliates. Yes. Supporters of the show, stdcheck.com. This is how Emma and I get tested for STIs on the regular. Mm-hmm. And we love it. It's easy. We've gotten so much amazing feedback on how awesome and easy it is. Um, so check it out. You get a $10 discount if you use the links on our website and it supports the show. So we're eternally grateful to you for that. Uh, that brings the cost of a 10 panel test down to about $130, which is tough to beat. Yes. That's tough to be. Super tough. So check it out under the resources tab or on the show notes of this episode. Uh, thank you in advance for getting tested, supporting health and safety in the community and supporting the show. Yes, we really, really appreciate it. And next week, episode 200. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Woohoo! We're excited. Uh, we have an interview with Casey and Marcus. So you'll have to come back and stay tuned and listen then. Yeah. We're also going to unveil a brand new intro. <gasps> So but, exciting. But only the people who listened this far know that. Right. And so they can all hold us accountable if we don't. <laughs> right? If we don't do it. <laughs> also. The plan is a new intro. It's important to remind you that if you want to come on the show, if you want to share your story, or if you want to let us know who you are, how you are, how we're doing, anything of like that, reach out to us. Head over to our website. Click on the Contact Us tab. Send us an email. Send us a voicemail. We'd love to hear from you. We will respond to you as long as you say kind things. Yes. You don't have to agree with us, but you got to be kind. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah. Just reach out to us. Normalizingnominomy.com. And we will see everybody next week for episode 201. <laughs> Funny. Funny? Yeah. You're so hilarious. I know. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>